Hey guys, welcome back to another Surgical Tech Tips. Uh, today we are going over the perfusion machine itself. Uh, this is a machine that you're only going to see in the heart room, uh, only in the open heart room. And I have Sam here, he's, uh, he's our local perfusionist, good guy, crazy good beard, as you can see. Uh, but. Yeah, to simplify this machine, basically it's, it's put in place to oxygenate the, the blood from the heart. Um, when we go on bypass and when we, when we need to open up the heart and the surgeon needs to maybe replace a valve or fix a hole in the heart for some, for some reason, we have to stop the heart and basically arrest the patient, basically kill the patient for us to work on the heart. Uh, he's here and this machine is here to ensure that the patient doesn't actually die. Yeah, that's exactly it's a, right. It's a, it's a, yeah. That's essentially what it is. Yeah. So the blood that he is taking from the field through, through, this, through like the tubing that's hooked up to his perfusion machine, uh, the venous blood is going, going directly into his reservoir on his pump. Moving into, this, this is basically the heart of his machine or you know, comparable to the heart inside of a person right. because this is pumping the blood through here into his oxygenator. He's oxygenating the blood and then giving that blood right back to the patient. So the organs stay intact, the brain is still perfectly fine and oxygenated. Everything with that patient is perfectly fine as we work on the heart and as that heart is arrested. It's really cool. The, uh, the invention of the heart-lung machine is what allowed heart surgery to really take off in the 50s and what it is today. Um, without it, the surgeon really is limited in what he can fix on the heart. And with this machine, we basically take over the responsibility of the heart and lungs. So he can do whatever he wants to the heart, fix it, cut it open, and then we um, provide the body with the, the nutrients it needs, and just like the heart would, through the blood. All right, so the first thing is this heart-lung machine is basically useless if we can't hook it up to the patient. If we're not able to receive the blood and give the blood back to the patient, there's no reason to even have it. So we'll talk about the function of it here in a little bit, but first let's talk about how we actually get the patient onto the heart-lung machine. So the first thing is, it's gonna be a very busy time for the techs, because you're gonna be being pulled in lots of different directions. So I apologize for that, but it's just, for whatever reason, you know how it is. It's like fast, fast, and then slow, and that's just the world we live in. So while, while you're cannulating, the surgeon is putting in purse string stitches on, you know, the aorta and the atrium and, and all these different places on the heart to place these these cannulas that he's about to show you. So while he or she, you know, the surgeon is doing that, at the same time. He's standing right here wanting you to throw tubing off to him and organize the tubing so he can start hooking up, you know, the pump to the sterile field as well. Yeah, so like Shane said, so you get the purse strings in for, um, into the heart and stuff, and then you're gonna use these cannulas. This is like the connecting, this is connecting the human to the machine. Without these cannulas, we can't, I can't just hand them tubing and it magically take the blood out. This is what allows the blood to come out. You can see a few holes at the bottom there. That allows the blood to enter into the tubing and then you add a connector right here that connects to the tubing and now the human is connected to the machine. And the same with the other side when we're giving the blood back. Um, this just has a, a, a smaller hole there, just one that connects here to this side. So, the surgeon gets these two cannulas. We're just gonna place them here as if they're in the patient right now. I've handed up this sterile tubing to you and it's just protected by this, this plastic and we just pull it down as you're pulling the tubing out and that way all the tubing inside of here is sterile. So then, once we feel comfortable that the tubing looks good and that there's no air in the tubing, you're able to clamp these lines and cut them. Because right now it's just a circle, and once again, it's not going to help us connect the patient if we're just going in a circle right It's here. just one continuous tubing, so you, got, you have to be able to clamp and cut you know, each side of the tubing, throw away the excess, and you'll, you'll end up with your, your red arterial and your blue 
venous lines. So at this point, we're going to hook this tubing up to the, to the cannula, and then this side to this cannula. And now, the patient is able to be in our loop. So now they're part of the loop. Yep. So that is how we connect the patient to the heart-lung machine. So now let's kind of go over that, that loop that he was talking about. So this is where the loop starts. Yeah, this is where the magic happens. Um, so we've hooked up to the patient and now we're receiving venous blood from the patient because it's connected to the right side of the heart. Basically deoxygenated blood. Um, not very helpful um, if that's all you have. So it comes down into our reservoir and this becomes the heart. While the surgeon's working on the heart, this acts as the heart. It pushes this tubing and propels the blood forward. Once it gets propelled through here, it starts going into the rest of the machine, which is the oxygenator, which plays the most important part because it takes that venous blood that we were talking about and turns it into arterial blood. Um, if we weren't able to do that, the heart-lung machine would be useless. So the oxygenator is pretty much the most important part of the machine. Um, once it's oxygenated, it rides up through this tubing and goes back into the patient. So another cool feature that the heart-lung machine has is that we're able to cool or heat the patient through the oxygenator. We simply hook it up to what we call a heater cooler that runs hot or cold water through it and there's a transfer of energy and it allows us to cool the patient down. Cooling the patient, um, why would that be important? Well, because it slows your metabolism down and we're doing some very invasive work right now on the heart. Um, the better we can protect the, the rest of the body, the organ, the brains, the, the more successful the surgery is gonna be. So that is why um, it's so important that we're able to cool them as well. All right, so we've kind of gone over We've kind of gone over how the pump hooks up to the field and hooks up to the patient. We've gone over the heart and lung oxygenator portion of this perfusion machine. And now let's just move on down the line and talk about, uh, talk about this machine. Yeah, that's great. So yeah, so now we're successfully on bypass. Um, I don't know about you, but trying to sew on a moving target, pretty difficult. Very hard. So, in order to facilitate an easier surgery, we're able to arrest the heart and basically take a beating heart and cause it to be completely still so the surgeon can, can work on it. Um, so the way this machine works, basically hand it off another tubing to us and we're able to infuse potassium, kind of like the lethal injection, down the coronaries um, and causing the heart to arrest. It's pretty interesting to watch on on our monitors because you can yes. see everything go flat. Just see the EKG go. You know, if anywhere else in the OR, everyone would be freaking out and CPR yeah. would be initiated and, you know. We actually have to stop the heart in this room to be able to work on. Right, exactly. So it's, it's really cool. It's really cool to watch um, just because it's not something you get to see every day. And, um, and like I said, now the heart's completely stopped. The patient's legally dead. However, we're keeping them alive with the heart and lung. The heart and lung. The heart and lung is what's keeping that patient alive. And then moving on down the line, we've got these uh, these three guys there. Um, those are basically like vents, vents and suckers. Uh, that's part of your tubing that you'll get on the sterile field as a surgical tech. Uh, they're hooked up to those, these, these ba basically just three separate uh, sucker lines. Um, it's, it's, those are in place to obviously use for suction on the field and, you know, instead of a cell saver suction, you know, going to the cell saver and being processed through the cell saver, uh, we have a pump sucker where the blood will go directly from, you know, our field, you know, through the pump sucker and it'll be able to go right back into, uh, right back into the pump and have it oxygenated and go right back into the patient. Um, these are very important because these are going to save um, the patient receiving blood products at the end of the case. If we use these properly, we can save most of the blood that would normally be lost in the, in, in the field yeah. and give it right back to the patient. Yeah. So it's really nice to have these available because blood usage does go down if we use them correctly. And 
Also helps a lot with, at the end of our heart procedures, there's a lot of air that's left in the heart because obviously we have to open up the heart. Uh, we do our best with kind of flooding the, flooding the field with CO2, uh, but there's still a lot of air in the heart and you'll see a lot of air bubbles, you know, after we close the heart up. So we have a vent line in place in the aorta to kind of vent all that air out of the heart before we uh, before we come off the pump. Yeah, we try to catch as much air as we can. Everyone yeah. knows that air to your brain is not a good thing. Yeah. And that's a bad day for a patient. It is a very bad day for a patient. <laughs> so these lines are really important. They look really simple. It's just one little tubing and a little pump, but they do a lot of good. And they're, they're, they make our job a lot easier too. Yeah. All right, guys. So that's the uh, that's basically the perfusion machine. We tried to give you a simplified version of uh, of this uh, heart and lung machine, and I hope you guys enjoyed the video. We'll see you again next time. We were we're finishing up the video here, and just had the thought that a lot of you out there watching this video will probably ask a ton of questions about how to become a perfusionist. So yes. Take it away. I mean, with how convincing we were, with how cool it is, yeah. I mean, there's going to be like millions of people <laughs> knocking down the door to become perfusionists. There's going to be a, a huge flood of perfusionists. Yeah. So step one, there's only 17 schools in the whole United States right now. They're graduating about 150 students a year. So it's a pretty small, small group of people. Um, it's kind of, it's kind of hard to. You, you just, nobody knows about it. So once you know about it, it's kind of like, okay, now what do I do? So that's where I'm here to help. Um, first thing you need to do is kind of figure out um, what school you want to go to because all of them have different um, criteria to get in. Most of them are going to require a bachelor's in some kind of science. You're going to need a lot of chemistry, biology, all that good stuff. Um, I majored, I did all kind of the pre-med stuff because I didn't really know what I wanted to be, a dentist, doctor, whatever, and then I heard about perfusion and I'm like, gosh, that's like a really cool gig. Um, so any of those science-y majors will do, or any major will do that you've taken the science courses on top of. Um, once you do that, like I said, um, there's 17 schools. You just have to look up perfusion schools, and they'll list their criteria. Um, you have to figure out what you want for yourself. Some of the perfusion schools are a master's degree. Some of them are a second bachelor's. Some of them are just a certificate program. Um, I can tell you that the pay is pretty much the same, but there are some perks to having a master's. If you ever want to go back and teach perfusion school, you're going to want to have a master's. So it's kind of up to you what you want. Um, really study the schools. Um, where I went, I did you know over 250 cases um, as a student. So when I got out, I felt very prepared and ready to be on my own. Um, whereas some of the other schools don't have as many cases, but they do a lot of research. Um, so it kind of depends on what, what your cup of tea is, what you want to do. Um, but like I said, it's a, it's a very small field. So in order to get in, um, I recommend doing lots of extracurricular activities, um, lots of service, you know, just really beefing up that resume. Um, being a surgical tech, I mean, that helps a lot because you've been in the ORs. Mm -hmm. So maybe you're sitting here going, you know, maybe surgical tech isn't for me and I want to move on or whatever. Um, you have a, a much higher likelihood of getting into perfusion school just because you have that experience that's very valuable. It's very hard to get into ORs if you just, don't have the experience. Yes, yeah, exactly. So true. you guys are already leaps ahead of, ahead of most people that want to become perfusionists. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, I hope that helps. Um, yeah, just look up the, those schools, type in perfusion schools, and you'll see the 17 that are out there and really you know, call it the directors. All the directors are really personable. Um, perfusionists are usually pretty happy. Um, we, we, we like talking about ourselves because nobody knows about us. Uh, so yeah, call up the director and say, hey, I'm interested in your school. Tell me what your school has to offer me. You know, make sure it's a good fit for you. That's good. Cool. All right. There you have there it. There you have it. <laughs> Jinx. Jinx. <laughs>